whatever begins to exist has a cause it seems to me that this premise is supportable both philosophically and scientifically philosophically i think that this statement is a sort of first principle of metaphysics for anybody who really contemplates it i think that it's obvious that whatever begins to exist has a cause basically this is saying that things don't come into being out of nothing things don't just pop into existence uncaused out of non being being does not arise from non being being only comes from being and so as i say this is a kind of first principle of metaphysics and and metaphysics for those who don't know is that branch of philosophy which deals with the ultimate questions of what is real what exists it in metaphysics asks about the nature of ultimate reality uh, aristotle described metaphysics as the study of being um, and so that's why I say this is a sort of first principle of metaphysics because basically what it says is that being only comes from being. Being does not arise from non-being. Something cannot come into existence out of nothing. Now as such, I think that the principle is obvious to anybody who understands it and that any defense you could give of the principle would be based upon premises which are less obvious than the principle itself. And as Aristotle said, you shouldn't try to prove the obvious via the less obvious. So that in that sense, I think it's somewhat uh, maladroit. Uh, it's somewhat misconceived to try to argue for the truth of this first premise. It's better to just help the unbeliever understand it and then hope that he's honest enough to grasp it. And there are ways in which you can make this intuitively obvious. For example, one of the things I like to say is that uh, none of us believes that, say, a raging Bengal tiger could suddenly pop into being out of nothing in this room right now, or, or that a, an Eskimo village or a gasoline station might just pop into being uncaused out of nothing in this room. I, I think anybody recognizes things don't just pop into being uncaused out of nothingness. Sometimes uh, I'll say to audiences, nobody here in the audience is worried that while we're here listening to this uh, talk that back home in your living room a horse might have popped into being out of nothing and is there defiling the carpet uh, while we talk. We don't worry about those kind of things. So these aren't arguments, I think you'll understand, these aren't arguments for premise one, but they're just ways of illustrating it, just making it intuitively uh, appealing so that the unbeliever says, yeah, that, that's obvious. Now, Cindy, I think, had a point. I just wanted to ask your thought on the unbeliever who says that at the beginning of the universe, prior Big Bang, do they acknowledge that there was a cause? Or it, are they, they acknowledge there was a cause, they just don't know what the cause is, and they get into the expanding, shrinking universe, and that sort of Now, you're talking about the Big Bang theory. Well, I'm just, yes, I am as an example, but I think it's relevant in that when you talk about a cosmological argument, yes. then you have to go back to the very beginning of the cosmos right. to say, how did it come into being? And right. it's curious, when you argue atheists about this very point, do they embrace that, yes, everything that begins to exist has a cause, or do they try to argue okay. that, or do they say, yes, it has a cause, we just don't know what it is? All right. Okay, good question. Notice on the outline under 2.3 and 2.31, we will talk in more detail about the scientific aspects of this question. But let me answer Cindy's question directly. When I began to work on this argument in my doctoral work in England, I didn't think anybody would attack the first premise. I thought it would be the second premise they would go after, and therefore that's where I really focused my big guns was defending the second premise. I have been astonished, Cindy, the degree to which atheists, when their backs are against the wall, will say, the universe just popped into being uncaused out of nothing. Yeah. They will finally just say, well, it, it just started. Yeah. And I have a friend, Quentin Smith, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of Western Michigan. And in our book that we wrote together on theism, atheism, and Big Bang cosmology, his final position is this. He says, the most rational thing to believe is that the universe came from nothing 
by nothing and for nothing. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's sort of a good conclusion to a Gettysburg Address of Atheism, I think. Um, but to me, that is the most irrational thing to believe. I think if you can get the atheist to that point, then you have succeeded in your argument. Because it is only, I think, the darkened intellect that can stand before God on the judgment day and say, well, God, the reason I didn't believe in you was because I thought that things could just pop into being and cause out of nothing, you know. Uh, as I sometimes point out in, in talks, this is really worse than magic. When you think about it, it's worse than magic. Because in magic, when the magician pulls a rabbit out of the hat, you've at least got the hat. And you've got the magician. <laughs> yeah. But you know, in this case, the, the universe just pops into being out of nothingness. Yeah, they will also tell there's no such thing as supernatural or miracles or anything like that. And yet, to me, this is the ultimate thing. Because the whole point of the miracle. It is the ultimate miracle. This is an interesting point. We sometimes have talked, I think, in this class about the argument for the resurrection of Jesus, which is a sort of argument for God from miracles. But really, this is the argument from miracles writ large. It is the universe coming into being that requires a supernatural cause beyond the natural realm because, in this case, it is the whole natural realm that comes into being. So it cannot have a natural explanation because it is the whole theater of natural causes which pops into existence and so points to a miraculous supernatural explanation. Well, if you're committed to the impossibility of miracles, you can't accept that. But then that gets into the question of miracles, which I'm not talking about now, but notice that only an atheist, only someone who has a proof of atheism can deny the possibility of miracles. Because as long as God's existence is even possible, then it's possible that there are miracles. So the atheist, in order to avoid this argument, needs to have some sort of a proof that there is no God and that therefore miracles are impossible. In the absence of a proof of God's non-existence, he needs to be open to the possibility of miracles and therefore to the possibility that the universe has a cause of its being. Um, and I was saying it's intuitively obvious in itself uh, and it, it seems to me that we can give illustrations to try to make this evident to the unbeliever that ought to, to cause him to believe. But in fact, I, I think there are even philosophical arguments for this. Uh, for example, I think it was Jonathan Edwards who argued for this first premise by saying that if things could really pop into being uncaused out of nothing, then it's inexplicable why just anything and everything doesn't pop into being out of nothing. <laughs> and, and because after all, before they exist, there isn't any sort of nature that would constrain what sort of things could pop into being out of nothing because before they exist there just isn't anything there so why doesn't why don't you know television sets and charles darwin and things like this pop into being uncaused out of nothing it uh if if things could really come into being uncaused out of nothing then it does seem inexplicable why just anything and everything wouldn't do so which obviously contradicts experience. Yes, Stephanie. I just wonder if you could get them to at least concede that if if God and a supernatural cause doesn't exist, therefore miracles can exist, to get them to concede that the very possibility of things just popping into being would be miraculous. So in a sense, they're believing in a miracle. Yeah, that, well, that's the difficulty, is that these folks, when their backs are to the wall, will say that it's not miraculous for things to pop into existence uncaused out of nothing. It, it just happens. You know, uh, the, the, uh, remember I said, well, some, those of you who were here last week and saw the video, remember what I said about how every person has inside of himself a sort of skeptical dial, and you can ratchet it way up when it comes to arguments for conclusions that you don't like, but then you can dial it way down for your own views. And I think this is the perfect example of this, is that when their backs are to the wall, atheists just dial up that skeptical dial really high and say, you can't prove that whatever comes into being uh, has a cause, uh, that it, it could just come into being out of nothing. But they would never accept that sort of explanation at any other level of, of human experience. Uh, 
if you walked into your bedroom and found a horse there you wouldn't think it just popped into being out of nothing you would say there had to be a cause for what brought it there so this is part of this difference that i described last week between what j i packer calls travelers along life's way and balconiers who can discuss the journey talk about it but aren't really on the road themselves